Hello? Can you hear me? Um, I cannot hear you just a second. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. No, no. no, it's fine. Okay. Hello. So I guess we'll start in five minutes sharply, and then I will do a short introduction and then, um, okay. you know. Just one question. Uh, how would you pronounce your surname to be correct? Well, to be correct would be Sirac. That's the Spanish Sirac. pronunciation. Yeah. Sirac, you can say Sirac, that sounds okay. Okay, perfect. I'm actually, actually learning now Spanish, beginner level, and kind of, it's really hard to pronounce T instead of, you know, C, where it's the use in like other Spanish countries. Yeah. Yeah, you could imagine in, in Spain is like TH, Sirac. Something like that. Yeah. In the South American, they would say like an S, C rank. Yeah. You know, Much easier <laughs> yeah. to pronounce. Yeah. Yeah. Are you currently in Germany? Sure. Probably. Are you currently in Germany? Your office? Yeah, yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've, yeah. Been, I've been here already for 20 years. Yeah. I know maybe COVID made it possible to travel a bit more. Yeah. <laughs> So I cannot hear you well, so there is some echo somehow. But um, maybe it's my microphone. Yeah. So I can I can hear you, but that's a lot of noise when you speak. Yeah. I will try to. Uh, how about now? That's much better. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So your society, it's built on... Yes, yeah, so we are... Students, postdocs, professors, everybody who wants to join, what is that? So it started as a student society. So it's run by essentially mostly graduate students and then undergrads. And yeah, we do a range of talks, inviting a lot of different interesting speakers, uh, essentially for our own hobby. And yeah, it's essentially to show more about quantum information, quantum computing, essentially to people and other physics topics. So yeah, so we're not really tied with any department, but Again, we're all students at, like, I'm a theoretical chemist. Uh, the president of the society is a, a physicist. He's in laser and atomic physics. So I there's see. a lot of people around, yeah. Okay, I see. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so a few minutes. Slowly people are gathering. But yeah. I guess we were starting for the people here. I will just uh, give a, a few different announcements. So before the talk, uh, obviously, for people who don't know, this is Oxford Quantum Information Society. As I said before, this is a student-led initiative, initiative and essentially a society that interested about quantum information computing. And we do a lot of different events. So really happy to attract different great speakers, but we also do flash talks. Uh, last year, we did one, a few different uh, workshops, well, this year, but essentially not only talks, but we organize different workshops, for example, introduction to quantum computing, even for those people who are not really had any experience with physics before. And uh, I want to essentially after I will done the introduction, we're now will be having uh, our society committee essentially elections the, at the end of this term. Uh, so we're looking for people who would replace the current committee uh, for the society for the next year, and hopefully maybe someone who would want to contribute in organizing these events, either from um, writing to different people, uh, organizing the talks itself, setting up the Zoom and seminars, or hopefully maybe sometime in the future, 
uh, doing the real life events or maybe helping finding different sponsors that could help us with money and other different things. Um, everyone is welcome to join um, our society and come to the election. So I will uh, now send out the form um, in the chat. As well, we will have a few nice talks next week. So there will be one talk by Professor Jens Eisert uh, on the topic towards closing the loopholes of showing of showing a quantum advantage. It will be on Monday, and there will be another really great talk by another really great speaker, Professor Mikhail Lukin, on exploring new scientific frontiers with programmable quantum systems. And that will be on uh, 4th of March. And I will also send out the uh, registration links. Yeah, and today we're really uh, happy and not us, but and probably everyone who come here. Really happy to have Professor Ignacio Tirak uh, for, for giving us a talk this evening. And uh, Professor Ignacio is, had, uh, has a really prolific scientific career, and it's he's one of the most probably scientists alive currently. And shortly about him, he's originally from Manresa, Spain. And in 1991, he received his PhD from Complutense University of Madrid. And really, really quickly after that, he first was an associate professor at the University of Castilla-La Mancha. And then he became a professor of physics at the University of Innsbruck, Austria. And uh, from 2001, he became the director at the Max Planck Institute of Quantum Optics in Germany. And in 2002, he also became a honorary professor at the Technical University of Munich, Germany. These two titles he has been holding until this day. And he, for his many contributions to science, became a recipient of many different awards and honors, uh, such as uh, in 2016, he got the Prince of Asturias Award for Technical and Scientific Research in 2009. He got BBB, BBVA Foundation Frontiers of Knowledge Award. In 2010, he got Benjamin Franklin Medal. In 2013, he got the famous Wolf Prize in Physics. Uh, then in 2018, he got the Max Planck Medal of, from the German Physical Society. And in 2018, he got the Quantum Computer Prize of the Misuse Foundation China. His research spans many different topics and uh, notably in quantum information, quantum computation and quantum many body physics. Yet today, as you will hear, he will focus on the last topic and tell us more about why it's really difficult to solve many product problems and how these analog quantum simulators could maybe speed up this process. So thank you for joining us. And uh, yeah, we're really happy to have you here today. Okay, thank you very much. So I hope that you can see my screen. Yeah. Okay, very it's good. Working. Well, okay, perfect. So thank you uh, very much for the very kind introduction. And so I'm going to talk about quantum simulations and the difficulty of solving many body problems. So that would be um, not a technical talk, even though at some point I will introduce a couple of technical terms, but I would basically give you a tour on quantum simulation of many body systems. And uh, in particular, I will present some work that we did together with these people here. So Yiminge, Yoritura, Sirilu, and Marikan and Banyuls, all of them are or have been at our institute. This is the Max Planck Institute of Quantum Optics. OK, so let me start with something that you, your members of this Quantum Information Society should know very well, is that there are some problems in, in, in nature that are very difficult to simulate and much more difficult than the ones that we are typically used to. And so one can say that simulating the weather or predicting the weather, it's very difficult. However, uh, there are some problems that are intrinsically more difficult than those. And those are that uh, they appear in uh, areas like chemistry or, or, or physics, material science, or high energy physics. And the reason behind that is that even if you would make the simplest problem, the simplest model in order to uh, study these problems, namely one in which you just discretize a space in one way or another so that you have a lattice, 
And in each side of the lattice, you put the quantum system, which is the simplest that we have, like a qubit or a two-level system or a spin one half particle. Then if we want to make any prediction about any of the systems with the simplest, this very simple model, then we will realize that the, uh, since they are described by the laws of quantum physics, then the physical information about these systems will be contained in what we'll, we call the state, quantum state of the system, which would be in a linear superposition of all possible configurations. So we'll have the configuration of our qubits, all of them in zero, or all of them in zero, one, and two on one. And uh, we'll have a, a linear superposition and everything that we are interested in when we describe the systems will be contained in these coefficients, these complex coefficients here, which characterize the physical properties of that system. And you can see right away that if we have n of these qubits, then the number of configurations that we have is two to the power n, and therefore the number of coefficients that we need in order to describe this quantum state will be two to the power n complex coefficient. And so if you want to do any computation with a computer, then you will have to store these coefficients. And this means that you will have to have a memory that grows exponentially with the number of qubits that you have in your system. And this number of qubits, if you discretize space, will be something like the volume. So the memory resources in your computer grow exponentially with the volume of the system that you want to describe. And in the same way, since you will have to compute these coefficients, for each of the coefficients, you will have to do at least one operation. And therefore, the, num the, the time that it will require to complete your computation will also scale exponentially with the number of qubits or the volume of your system. So we see right away that when we have these kind of problems that are many body problems, where there are many particles, like in this case, there are many atom on atoms or electrons. In this case, there are many atoms, or in this case, that they're also uh, elementary particles, then we have to pay a price when we saw it with a classical computer, which is both in memory and in time, and both of them grow exponentially with the number of qubits that we have. And this makes the problems very difficult. So as soon as we have something like 20 or 30 qubits, then we cannot simulate the systems. And this is a very strong constraint to describing physical or chemical properties of the system. In fact, one could, and this will be important for what I say later on, one could trade memory by time. So for example, what happens if I have a memory that only grows linearly with the size of my system or is constant? So I have a computer with a constant memory and I cannot scale with the size of my system. Then uh, the, you'll have to pay the price in time and the price in time, so could be something like it's super exponential in N typically. So, I mean, the message of this transparency is that simulating many body, quantum many body system is very difficult with classical computers because this double exponential in time or because you have an exponential uh, uh, scaling of the memory and time resources with the number of qubits. That's something that is very well known already for many years. And there many people realize that and maybe the one who voiced it first was Richard Feynman in his famous paper of 1981, where he, at that time, he was describing uh, problems in high energy physics. And he realized that if you want to solve them with classical computers, that's very, very uh, inappropriate in a sense, because this proliferation of coefficients and therefore these requirements that I mentioned before. So at the time, this was the late 70s, beginning of the 80s. So people just discover a quantum chromodynamics and standard model and things like that. And they were trying to solve those problems with classical computers. And they realized right away that it was very, very difficult. And that's why this paper written by Richard Feynman. And what he realized in that paper is that, in fact, if you have a quantum many body system, you've better try to compute things using a many body, a quantum many body system as well. So what he proposed, if you have to solve one of the problems that I mentioned before, instead of taking a classical computer with classical bits and trying to encode their, these coefficients, why don't you use a quantum system which has quantum bits, I mean, a quantum computing, see, in fact, he called it quantum computer, in which 
Now you just use n qubits in order to encode the n qubits that you want to describe. So namely, if you want to um, predict properties about a certain state of your many body system, just take a quantum computer with n qubits and prepare the state such that you only need n qubits in your quantum computer. And now you perform measurements and average you know, following the laws of quantum physics, then you will be able to uh, characterize the physical properties of that system. And you see that right away, you gain in memory because again, the, in order to store n qubits, you will need n qubits in your quantum computer. So the memory requirements are linear in n. And at the time, he did not care about time requirements, but now we know that there is also, depending on the problem that we want to solve, there is also a speed up or an advantage if you use a quantum computer in time. So it may scale not exponentially in n, but maybe linearly in n, or even maybe exponentially in n, but even if it could scale exponentially in n, since we have a linear dependence in memory, then we should compare here with this super exponential that I mentioned before. So even if there is an exponential dependence in time, we will have some gain with a quantum computer with respect to classical computers. Now, that's something that is well known for many years. What has changed during the last, let's say five to 10 years is that now we have prototypes of quantum computers. And let me distinguish two kinds of quantum computers. One of them is the digital quantum computer in which any operation is divided in terms of discrete operations, what we call quantum gates. There is another kind of quantum computer, which is called analog computer, and in which you want to study one problem of the one that I mentioned before, what you can do is to take another system, and this other system is a system that you can control very well. This would be your, your quantum computer. And in this quantum computer, you engineer the interactions between the different components of the system, which could be, for example, atoms, in such a way that they are described, the interactions between your analog quantum computer are the same as the one that you want to describe. So this is why it's called analog, because you just replace the physical system that you want to solve by some system that you have in the lab and you engineer the interactions in such a way that it behaves like the problem that you want to solve. In both cases, you have this exponential gain in memory uh, as compared to classical computers. And here, I mean, you will have to do things in a discrete way. And here you want to study the problem, then you have to do it in an analog way. And both of them are to some extent available nowadays. In particular, I mean, you heard very well that we have now in several uh, places in the world, and notably in Google, IBM, but also in Rigetti, in many companies and universities, we have these NIST devices, which is something a little bit in between. It's a quantum computer, it can be based on gates. However, it's noisy and it's a small, but still it may be able to solve some problems in a better way than a classical computer. In fact, um, the Google experiment that took place uh, a, one and a half years ago demonstrated that with this device, even though it's a kind of a prototype and it's noisy, can solve some say, academic problem in a more efficient way than with classical computers. So the problem I want to address is with these systems that are here, either with a, let's say, an ideal quantum computer, digital quantum computer, or with an existing analog quantum computer, or with an existing digital NISC quantum computer. So can you solve problems in many body physics that you cannot solve with classical computers? Can these systems that already that are already available or will be built in the near future can give us some advantage to solve these problems of many body physics with respect to the classical computers? And so now to formulate the problems, so typically this would be problems in lattices. So like uh, I mentioned before, this happens in a very natural way in problems in condensed matter physics. In high energy physics, this uh, happens because you discretize space. In chemistry, then you can also put them on the lattice. And at the end, the problem is typically specified by a Hamiltonian, which tells you how the different particles that are here in the lattice, which will be typically qubits, fermions or some other particles, how they interact with each other. And so what I will assume throughout this talk is that the Hamiltonian that describes this interaction is a sum of Hamiltonians that act locally. So for example, it could be a term in your Hamiltonian that acts here, 
which describes the interaction between these particles, and another term which describes the interaction between these particles. What will be important here is that this is local, even though many of the things that I will say also apply to the case where these Hamiltonians are not local. But anyway, so local means that act on a, a small region. And we know that um, this, uh, finally, any fundamental theory in physics is local because otherwise we violate causality. So, uh, and so this is the problem. Somebody gives us a Hamiltonian and the lattice, and then we want to find properties, physical properties, describe physical properties corresponding to the system. And these physical properties would correspond to either dynamical problems in which you start with some initial state and then you switch on this Hamiltonian and then there will be some evolution. And then you want to predict how the physical properties of this system change as a function of time. That's what I will call dynamics or it can be thermal equilibrium. You assume that the system has thermalized because when it's in contact with the environment around it, has certain temperature. And then I would like to compute what are the physical properties at this given temperature. And maybe this temperature could be zero temperature. And so I will um, specify also what happens when we are considering like the zero temperatures, one particular case of thermal equilibrium. And we will be interested not in the whole state. So we are never interested in the, sorry, in the whole state. So the whole state that these two to the n coefficients this doesn't tell us anything. We are interested in physical properties, which in quantum physics means in expectation values of physical observables or operations of operators. I will describe this more in detail later on. So that's a summary of my talk. So I'm going to talk about quantum many body systems and algorithms for to solve these uh, quantum many body systems, quantum algorithms for dynamical problems, for zero temperature problems, and then here for finite energy and temperature. I will specify what I mean by that. And I will per pay a particular attention to whether these algorithms can run already with analog quantum computers or with digital quantum computer or with NIST devices, so with present or planned technology. And also, I would uh, also uh, I would um, pay attention to whether these algorithms give some advantage, some quantum advantage. So, if the time that requires to solve a problem with the system scales linearly or exponentially or super exponentially with the number of qubits that you try to simulate. Okay. So, again, the talk is about quantum algorithms to solve relevant problems in physics, maybe in chemistry, with existing and future devices. And I'll pay, I'll put, I'll pay uh, uh, attention, special attention, so how they scale, whether there is a quantum advantage, whether you will work better than a classical, faster than a classical computer or not. Okay, so I start with the dynamics, so algorithms to describe the dynamics. So that's a typical problem. So again, that's the lattice, somebody gives you a lattice. And uh, so it could be in one, two, or three dimensions, gives you a Hamiltonian. So it means that it specifies this local Hamiltonian. So it tells you how the particles interact with each other. That's what is contained in this Hamiltonian. It also gives you some particular state. It tells you, let me start with some initial state, psi zero. And this initial state should be some state that is easy to prepare with your quantum computer. For example, a product state, a state in which each of the qubits has a well assigned state. For example, zero, 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 all of them are in the state zero. And what you would like to do, and it's, uh, you want to compute the expectation values of some observable. This would be some physical properties. So for example, what is the magnetization here? Or if you're interested in high energy physics, what is the Wilson loop here? Or it could be the um, energy per particle, any other property. And you would like to compute this for the state that is dynamically evolved according to Schrodinger equation. Okay, so physically this means that you start with some initial state, then you plug this Hamiltonian, then there will be some changes that are described by this formula here. And you will like to know how the physical property changes as a function of time. That's what is represented here. And this is the physical property corresponding to one of these observables, so one physical property. And actually, it's a problem for which there exists a quantum algorithm. This was uh, 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 proposed by Seth Lloyd back in 96. And he basically translated uh, uh, Feynman's idea into some quantum algorithm and showed that it was efficient, that this is efficient. 
So what he said is, okay, so what I will do with my quantum computer is very simple. I will prepare the state, psi. My quantum algorithm will prepare the state. And if I want to compute some expectation value, what I will do is that I will measure this observable in my state. And I will measure it many times. I would not all the results. And at the end, I will take the average. And the average, when the number of measurement is very large, will coincide with this number here. And then I can predict any observable in this way, just by preparing, measure, preparing, measure many times, repeating. And at the end, I'll get what I want to compute. And the only question is now, how do you do that? How do you now prepare your quantum computer in this state, in the state that is the dynamically evolved? And he proposed an algorithm for that. And the algorithm, it's, uh, it's relatively simple. And so you can distinguish the algorithm for two cases. The first one is very simple. And is the case now that's a little bit technical when these Hamiltonians that are here commute with each other then this operator, the exponential of the sum is equal to the product of the exponentials. This, this is only true if the Hamiltonians commute. And then you see that this, you can read this formula like having some initial state and then applying this operator here. But this operator, it's just acting on some region because I say that it's local. So this will require some quantum gates then the next operator, some other quantum gates, then some other quantum gates, some other quantum gates. So it automatically tells you how your algorithm will work. Just prepare your initial state and apply a certain quantum gates, like the ones that are applied quantum computer. You can decompose them in two qubit gates. And that's the algorithm. Now, if the Hamiltonians don't commute, it's typically the case. These Hamiltonians don't commute with each other. Then you cannot do that. And then what he used is a trick, what is called trotterization. So what you do in the first step is that you say that the exponential of uh, the evolution, this evolution operator can be written as an exponential of h divided by m to the mth power. That's an exact formula, of course. And then he took this and then he said, well, now you see we have h t divided by m and let's take m very, very large. So what it means is that this exponent here, if m is very large, will be very small. And so you, this operator will be e to the power zero, which is almost the identity operator, maybe with some corrections. And then you can easily show that if it is true, then actually you can use the same formula as before, even though they don't commute. Now you can approximate by the product of operators. And the reason, the technical reason is that the commutator, now that you're neglecting, would be quadratic in one over m. So it would be much smaller. And so now you can read this formula also in terms of quantum gates. So what you have to do is to apply this quantum gate, the next one, the next one, the next one, and then you will have to do it m times. And what you figure out is that if m is sufficiently large, then this will converge, this will give you the right result. And now you can check how m has to converge, uh, has to scale. And so he came up with this formula. He says, well, if the state, if I want to make an error epsilon, in the prediction of my observable, remember that, oops, I don't know what happened now. Okay, remember that we wanted to compute, this is the goal. And if you want to compute this plus minus epsilon with an epsilon error, then the time that your quantum computer will require would scale like the number of qubits. That's just, I mean, some, some value depends on your local Hamiltonians is the operator norm is called the Hamiltonians times the times that you want to simulate squared. So you see that this case polynomially with n, like n squared, and also polynomially with the time that you want to make the simulation. So it's extremely efficient, this algorithm, because in a quantum computer, this would take exponential time. Sorry, in a classical computer, this would take an exponential time. So you see that that's actually an algorithm, a quantum algorithm, where with a quantum computer, you gain in memory, because you only need n qubits instead of two to the n qubits, and you gain in time, because you don't re require two to the n but you require just yes, n square. So there's a huge advantage in this problem for a quantum computer. So after that, then there were many quantum algorithms improving on this idea, now very different or based on totalization. And I mean, the most efficient one that I know scales now like linear with n, linear with t, and the, the logarithm of one divided by the, by the error that you want to make. Okay. so. 
The summary of that is that if you want to uh, describe the dynamics of a many body system, you'd better use a quantum computer because you have a big gain with that. It's a very big gain. I think that this is the largest gain that we have with a, or the largest advantage that we have with a quantum computer as compared to a classical computer. And in fact, I mean, not these algorithms that I mentioned, but some similar algorithms could work with NISC and analog devices. And that's why you look at some of the companies and also some people building these analog quantum computers, then they're, I mean, one of the goals is to solve these dynamical problems with them because then they will have a very big advantage with respect to classical computers. Okay, so this was the problem number one, is studying the dynamics of this quantum many body system. Now I'm talking about the other kind of problems. I tell you now, let's not consider dynamics, let's consider equilibrium. Let's imagine that you take your problem and you your piece of material or your molecule, you cool it to zero temperature, to very, very low temperature. And we want to make predictions about the physical properties in thermal equilibrium and in particular at zero temperature. Okay, so this is how we specify these problems. Again, we are given the lattice. We are told how the particles interact with each other through this Hamiltonian. And now if you take this Hamiltonian and then you compute the eigenvalues and this will give you the spectrum. It will tell you what are the possible energies in that system. And then they will be discretized because we have a finite system. And so we are interested now in this lowest energy, the state here, the corresponding eigenvector to this Hamiltonian, this eigenvalue is called the ground state and corresponds to the state at zero temperature. So we want to compute properties of this state. So again, somebody give us, gives us an observable and wants to make a prediction of what is this observable now at zero temperature. So mathematically, it means that wants to compute the expectation value of this operator in the eigenstate psi zero of this Hamiltonian in what is called the ground state. So we should do this operation with the system. And now the situation is very, very different from the one that we uh, saw in the dynamics, because it's known already for many years that this problem is very difficult. Is uh, you, you can, uh, as, you, as you probably know, then you can classify problems in how difficult they are. If you solve it with classical or with quantum computers. There are, for example, the class of problems that can be solved in polynomial time with a classical computer, with some decision problems. There are the ones that cannot be solved in polynomial times with a classical computer, but can be checked in polynomial time. And then there are the ones that can be solved in polynomial time with a quantum computer, this PQP. So this is like the, the, the same, the counterpart of P for a quantum computer. And then there is this QMA, which is the counterpart of NP with a quantum computer. So these are problems that cannot be solved in polynomial time with a quantum computer, although they can be solved that they can be checked in polynomial time. So these are difficult problems even for quantum computers. And it turns out that the problem that just spelled out here belongs to this class. So it's very hard. So this means that the computational time in a quantum computer would scale, will scale exponentially with the size of your system. Okay, no longer polynomially, like the case of the dynamics. So that's a very difficult problem even for a quantum computer. Still, I mean, you have to still regain in memory. So the, uh, say the fair comparison would be this time with the one of a classical computer that has the same memory and then it was super exponential. So still there is some gain. However, I mean, it's not so good that it's a, a gain that is ex that, that's still exponential. Nevertheless, so let me give you an algorithm. Let me tell you how they work. Uh, a, very, an, a very intuitive algorithm to solve this problem. So you think about that, it's not so simple, okay? To, to take a quantum computer and to show how can you prepare this ground state? Hmm? How do you convince the quantum computer to find this eigenvector? And one idea is the following. So I'll explain it with a little bit detail because it's very simple. You consider now all the possible eigenvectors or eigenstates, En, and the corresponding eigenvalues, En. So this will be all these energy levels here and of your Hamiltonian. And as you know, they form a basis. And if they form a basis, it means that any state that you give me can be written as a linear superposition of these states. 
and the number of states that you have will be two to the power n, right? Because this Hilbert space has two to the n dimension, two to the power n. You have in qubits, which corresponds to all possible configurations. So, in principle, you can write any state as a linear combination of those. So what you do is that you create a random product state. So you take here and then you put some product state, some state, for example, zero plus one. So here, zero minus one. So here, zero. Here, uh, I don't know, square root of two, zero plus something, one, whatever. So you just take random states everywhere. And then you take random states. You can always write this product state as a linear combination, like I wrote here. And now what you could do is to measure this observable, this is an observable. So in principle, it can be measured. So now you can measure this observable in, in that state. And according to the laws of quantum physics that you learn in an undergraduate classes, then if you measure this observable, you will obtain as an outcome, one of the eigenvalues and the probability of obtaining this eigenvalue would be just the absolute value of this corresponding coefficient alpha square. Okay, and if this measurement is filtering, if you measure the energy, then the state that you will have after the measurement will be just, if you measure the energy En, would be the corresponding eigenvector. So you would project the corresponding eigenvectors. So what you can do is that you can just measure this observable, and of course, you will not obtain the ground state. So you will obtain certain energy. And so you note this energy. So this is E1, uh, the first one. Then you prepare the same state and you measure again. And then you will obtain another energy. And then you repeat it, repeat it, repeat it, repeat it, repeat it many times. How many times? Well, I mean, an exponential number of times. In such a way that you are sure with a very, very high probability that in one of your outcomes, you had the ground state, this is zero. Of course, you don't know what, how much is e zero. So you repeat it many times, many times, sufficient that you know that you have for sure one of the times it was this E0. And then you just take out all the possible values that you annotated, you take the minimum one. And then you will know that this is the ground state energy. And once you have done that, then you continue repeating the experiment and you wait until next time that you measure, you obtain this value E0. And since you know that this is zero, now you know how much is, is E0 because you I mean, check it before. Now when you measure your E0, again, just by chance, then you know that the state that you will have prepared will be the ground state. And once you have the ground state, then you measure this expectation value. And now you have to repeat it many times. And at the end, you will have to answer this question. So now, so the question is how many times do so you see what is the probability that I obtain the ground state and you can, easily check that you have a random state, then this alpha n will be typically one divided by two to the n half. So the probability, which is the square of that will be one divided by two to the n. So it means that you will have to repeat it this, I mean, two to the n times times something in such a way that you make sure that what I told you before is true. So it will be like some n times two to the n, the number of repetitions. So it scales exponentially with n, the number of repetitions, because it has to be exponential, you know, because uh, I'm sure is a, is, a, is a problem in QMA. And therefore, I mean, we expect that this will be exponential. Okay, so the number of repetitions, the computational time is one divided by the probability, which is what I told you before, time some, I mean, you have to repeat it many times, so will, there will be an extra factor in, in front. Now, actually, this is not going to work as I explained you. And the reason why it doesn't work is because I told you just measure the energy. However, measuring the energy is not some, something that you can do right away. So if I give this observable is very complicated, it's a sum of other observables. So probably you know how to measure each of them individually. And uh, therefore measuring this H cannot be done. You can measure one of these observables, but if you measure one of them, then you will not project your state. You will not obtain this energy. This will not work what I told you before. So this is why this algorithm doesn't work like that. So we cannot measure the energy, but only this term separately. And this is not equivalent to measuring this observable H. Okay, you use the rules of quantum physics, but instead with H, with one of these HN, then you will project it to an eigenstate of this HN, but this is not the same as the eigenstates of the, of, the, of the H. So this is not going to work. So this naive algorithm doesn't work, even though it scales very badly, it does not even work like that. So you have to do something else. And what is this something else? 
Well, fortunately, I mean, there were some people in the 90s that developed some algorithms to measure the energy. And this is what is called phase estimation. So there is an algorithm that is due to Alexei Kitaev that tells you that you have some state here. And uh, this state is an eigenstate of a Hamiltonian. What, in order to measure the energy, what you can do is to add some auxiliary qubits, all of them in zero, put some circuit in front, so Hadamard transformations, and control unitary dynamics, do some quantum Fourier transform, and measure at the end this auxiliary system. And so what will happen actually, what this circuit it does is that it takes your state, if this is an eigenstate, En, you evolve according to this operator, I mean, control to the other qubits. And what will happen is that your, your eigenstate doesn't change, but in the ancillas, it will appear the energy. Okay, so this algorithm takes state and writes in this auxiliary register the energy. I mean, and first, we'll be careful, there are many details, but that's basically what it does. And the only thing that you have to be able to do is to be able to both to apply these gates apart from Hadamard, you have to be able to do these gates. But these gates correspond to some evolution. And this evolution, we know how to do it because that was the first algorithm that I told you, that was the dynamical algorithm. So you can use now the algorithm that I mentioned before, the one by Lloyd or the one that was developed later on to put it here, put everything together. And now you can use it with what I told you before. So now again, you will have your product state, that's the random state. It's a random superposition of energy against states. And then you run through this algorithm, you use the superposition principle. So you copy here now the value of the energy in these auxiliary qubits. And now you just measure these auxiliary qubits and then you will get the energy. And now you can do what I told you before. You will get some value, then you repeat it, you get another value, you repeat it, you get another value until you are convinced that the value is here is there. And once you have that, then you repeat it until you get again this value, and then you know that your state. So this, this algorithm works indeed. How there is a refinement of this algorithm that is to use yet another very famous quantum algorithm that is due to Robert, and it was I mean formulated in a different way that is much more useful by these people here. It's called amplitude amplification. And so what it tells you is that if you have this superposition, and then you would like to measure the energy, then the probability that you get the ground state energy somehow will be like uh, absolute value of alpha square. Instead of doing, so you will have to repeat it one divided by alpha square times. Instead of doing that, what you can do is just this Grover algorithm and then will amplify the coefficient corresponding to the ground state energy. And if you do something like that, then you can repeat a number of times that's case like uh, the inverse of alpha zero, but to the power one, not to the power two. So this is a more efficient. So it means that in practice now, you can build an algorithm to find the ground state energy, just using the method that I told you before with phase estimation, with amplitude amplification. However, there's still many details that are uh, hiding behind, for example, for the phase estimation, what I told you would work if you have an infinite number of ancillas, but you don't have an infinite number of ancillas, so you cannot get the energy to all possible digits. Okay, you will have a finite number of digits. And then there are many details. And if you put all the details and you do the calculation, then you find that the first algorithm in which you do only phase estimation, the computational time scales like two to the power two n divided by epsilon, where epsilon is the error that you're going to make when you measure this observable. And the one that ha includes amplitude amplification reduces also the Grover's algorithm, then scales a little bit better. It scales like two to the power three n divided by two. Okay, so again, I mean, this is a very trivial algorithm that use some other algorithms. And this shows a little bit how quantum algorithms are built nowadays. So people, it's not that you discover a new algorithm, you want to solve a problem, then you take a little bit of an algorithm that exists from here, another one from there, then you add something, and in the end, you look at how it scales, you optimize it, and then you get one of these algorithms. So actually, it turns out that you can do um, quite better, much better than that. There is a more sophisticated, sophisticated algorithm, that's what is called the filter method that we proposed some time ago, in which now the computational time scales like two to the power n halves, 
in this case, like the logarithm of one divided by the error, not like the one of the other, the error, and scales like this delta. And this delta is this gap, it's called the gap, is the energy difference between the ground state and the first excited state. This case, like this quantity here. So if this gap, it's polynomial in N, so it may decrease as a function of N, then this will give you a very efficient algorithm. However, if this gap scales exponentially with N, so it's like e two to the minus N, then this will scale like the previous one. So that has an advantage as long as your gap is not exponentially small. And in these systems that I was mentioning that appear in physical systems and in many body systems and so on, so the gap never goes exponentially down. Okay, so when, even when you have for the experts, when you have a phase transition or quantum phase transition, then the gap typically in critical systems, this case like one divided by the number of qubits or one divided by the number of qubit scales, in which case this provides you an advantage. So that's kind of the state of the art, right? Of the algorithm is exponential as it should be. And I, I want to describe a little bit this filtering method. And I will give you just uh, some of the ideas. I will flash some of the ideas. And again, so it's based on first taking a random product state, like before. So this could be written as a linear superposition of the eigenstates. And now what you do is that you filter the state in the same way as you filter light. So you have a light which has many colors and you have to have only red light, then you put a fit filter and only the red light will come through. So here the idea is very similar. So you have a linear superposition of all possible states with your product state. And now what you can do is that you can filter this. So you can just get rid of the energies that are here or the superposition, the terms that are here and the terms that are here. And this can be done just by applying this filtering operator to your product state. And this filtering operator is nothing else like a Gaussian, which is centered at this energy, okay? So you apply this operator here, you can check right away, you put it here, that this is what we'll do out of the linear superposition of all of them of the random state, you will end up only with the ones that are around this energy E. And okay, so you're going to do that. When you do that, then now that you have filtered, then you can measure this energy and do something similar to what we say before. Now the problem, what is the problem? The problem is that this operator that is here is not unitary. So this means that it doesn't correspond to some quantum gates, set of quantum gates. But what you can do is like what you do in optics, the Euphoria transform. So you write this operator as the sum of operators in the form e to the minus iht. That's like the Fourier transform of that. You can write it as a sum. And then you see that what you have here is like a linear superposition of evolving according to different times. But this is the evolution operator. So again, this is the dynamics. So you see that if you can implement the dynamics of your system with an algorithm, and there exists one, and you know how to do superpositions of dynamics, then you will be able to implement this filter. And in fact, that's something that there are algorithms that do that. And in fact, it's possible now to create this algorithm. And now that's the way it works. And so at the end, you even use this phase estimation and amplitude amplification to speed it up. And that's the way that you get this scaling that I mentioned before. So it's a combination of what I told you before, preparing random state using phase estimation amplitude and adding this filtering, this, uh, this Fourier kind of uh, part. And yes, with that, then you get a better scaling. And that shows you also that there are people who do that, that take some algorithms and then improve these algorithms, improve the performance just by adding new pieces. Huh? Okay, I mean, the problem is that uh, unlike the dynamical algorithms that I mentioned before, this cannot be used with analog and NIST devices. So the fact that you can prepare superpositions of evolutions and things like that requires auxiliary system, gates, and so on. So it's very, uh, and you will need a fault tolerant quantum computing, uh, and a scalable quantum computing with that. So this doesn't work in practice. However, as you probably know very well, there exist some heuristic methods that work with NIST devices and with analog simulators. So one of them is the adiabatic algorithm in which instead of trying to aim at the ground state just by measuring and producing a random state, what you do is that you start with some state and that is well known, for example, a product state, and then you change your Hamiltonian slowly and you try to drag along 
the state in such a way that at the end, you end up with the Hamiltonian that you want to solve. And the state is the, uh, uh, the ground state of that system. So this adiabatic algorithm is heuristic, meaning that nobody can promise that, you, that it will work. So you don't know what is the time that that will take. There are variational quantum algorithms. And these variational algorithms are also heuristic. The idea is just you prepare, you will apply some gates. And in this gate, you, you optimize the parameters of the gate in order to minimize the energy. And if you do that, then this may work. And uh, I mean, the good part of these two algorithms for finding ground states is that they work with NISC devices. The, I mean, not so good part is that they are heuristic. So, I mean, may not work in practice. Okay, so now I move on to finite temperature. So I remember, remember that I first say quantum algorithms to describe the dynamics of your system, then quantum algorithms to compute physical properties of the ground state. Now let's want to find physical properties of finite energies or finite temperatures. And so what I will do is that I will formulate a little bit precisely the um, problem that I want to solve. And then I will tell you so how classical algorithms solve this problem. I will give you just a very overview, uh, brief overview. And then I will tell you how with a quantum algorithm, then you can have an exponential speed up also in time for some of these problems. And okay, so what is the problem? So the problem, roughly speaking, is that now instead of uh, computing the expectation value of some observable in the ground state, then you would like to do it now with some state that has certain finite energy. It's not the ground state, but it's somewhere in the middle of the spectrum. Somebody tells you, I want that this energy, what are the properties of, of states at that energy? Okay, and to formulate a little bit more precisely, I have to tell you something about uh, now Hamiltonians and the spectrum. So again, you remember that I had here, what was the spectrum, so all the energies of the Hamiltonian, now I put them horizontally. So this is what is the spectrum here, I plot the energy. And since we have a finite system, then we'll have all these discrete energies, and then there will be two to the n in total because we have n qubits. And so again, so these are these energies, these eigenvalues of the, of the spectrum. So you recognize here, this is the ground state. This is the lowest energy. And this would be the highest energy. And now we are interested in some energy that is here, somewhere in the, I mean, some, somewhere in the spectrum. And we would like to compute now the same as we did for the ground state for this energy. OK. So now what happens if you take the Hamiltonian and then you draw the spectrum, like I did it before, then if you start increasing the number of qubits, then of course there are two to the n states. So you will have to fill, I mean, this will be fill, and then you will not see anything. You will see yes, everything is black. So this is why people just study the distribution of the energy, but something that is called the density of state. So what you can do is that you can take some interval and count how many energy eigenstates are in this interval and you plot it. Then you take the interval, you move it to the right and plot how many states you put it to the right. And you see that in the interval, as I'm moving to the right, there are more and more states. So here in the center, there are many states. And then if I go to the right, there are lesser states. And if I go to the other boundary and the energy, there are less states. So this plot, this curve here, which is not so smooth in practice because you have a discrete spectrum is what is called the density of states. Now, if we increase the number of qubits, now we'll have two to the n, as I told you before, and you don't see anything, but the density of states, what happens is that we'll grow in this form. And it's very easy to show that if you have a local Hamiltonian, so the Hamiltonians that I was dealing here, then this density of states will be centered somewhere in the spectrum and has a width here that scales with the square root of the number of qubits. Okay. Now, Another concept that I need to define in order to describe what is the problem that I'm addressing here is that of energy density. So the energy you learn in, in thermodynamics and statistical physics that is an extensive quantity. So you see here you have a Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian has n terms. So the total energy would be the sum of n terms. So it will be proportional to n. And so this is why the total energy is proportional to the number of qubits that you have. Typically, this case like the total number of qubits because this is the number of terms that you have here. So what you're typically interested in physics is not the total energy, but the energy per qubit and to do what is called the energy density. So you divide the energy by n. And so now, instead of 
plotting here the 10 energy of the spectrum like before, let's divide by n. And so what will happen now is that the density of states that we had before, since we have divided by n, and before this has a width, which was a square root of n, you divide by n, then the width is like one divided by square root of n. So if you plot here the energy density as a function for different values of n. If n increases, then you see that it's getting narrower and narrower. So this density of state is getting very, very narrow. And in the limit n going to infinite, what is called the thermodynamic limit, you will get something like a delta function there. So all the states are then um, concentrated in some, in some region. And so the problem that I want to solve is the one on finite energy. So I will give you some energy density here. And I would like to compute physical properties of states that have this energy density. And I would like to know what happens if I scale and I make it n larger. And as you can see, that's, that's a problem. And that's, that's a kind of a, a bottleneck because as I increase n, I mean, there are less proportion of states here, right? Because this is getting narrower and narrower. Imagine that this is a Gaussian and there will be a tail here and there are few states here. So it's very difficult to get them. And that's why this problem will be difficult in general. Okay, so now we can formulate more precisely the problems for the mathematically oriented audience. Okay, so somebody gives you some energy density. Okay, so it gives you this small e and fixes that. And now, given this energy density, the precise formulation is the following. Okay, well, the first thing that you notice is, well, you would like to compute the value of some, so somebody gives you an observable. And you would like to compute the expectation value of this observable for states which have this energy density. However, since this is a discrete spectrum, there is very unlikely that you choose, well, it's the probability is zero, that you take one energy here, it will be an eigenstate there. So well, you will have to take it some width. So what you would like to find is some state which has a mean value, the energy that I gave you, okay? So the total energy E is like the one that I gave you times N. Okay, so you, I give you a small e, you compute capital E. With the capital E, you have to find a state which has this expectation value of the energy and has a variance, okay, which is this quantity here, which is proportional to some delta, so prescribed delta. Okay, so now we can formulate it again. So I give you some E, energy density, I give you an observable, and I give you some variance, and I give you some prescribed precision. So I would like to make an error epsilon in my computation. So what I would like to know is this quantum algorithm in order to do that, so what is the computational time and how it scales with N and also with epsilon and delta, no? especially with N. And so now you can also answer, uh, ask, so, so what is a reasonable delta? Okay, because now I'm telling you that there is a variance. So should, should the variance be I mean, n or 22 or something? And then, I mean, some physicists have found that for relevant physical problems, then this delta has to scale like one over n. So keep it in mind. Okay, so this problem one is compute the properties of a state which has this energy and has some width, some variance here, which is of the order of one over n. And this would be the relevant physical problem that we want to solve the computer. And we want to know how this scales with n. A second kind of problems is very similar, but now it's what is called in thermal equilibrium. So it's what we call canonical ensemble. So what we would like to do is to take now, a, to weight each of the states in the spectrum by this uh, Gibbs distribution, by this Boltzmann distribution with a probability that scales like e to the minus the energy at some particular point. And you would like to compute now expectation values. So average values of the expectation values with respect to all possible energies, but weighted with this factor. This is what is called the you know, in computation with the Gibbs state. Okay. And so this would correspond to the physics, physical properties, and so given temperature, which is the parameter that tells you how is this exponential here. Okay, so now formulate it more mathematically. So everybody gives you a finite temperature. Somebody gives you an observable. The goal would be to compute the expectation value of this observable with the Gibbs state, the state that is like that. It's described by this density operator from some prescribed error, right? And you would like to know how the algorithm scales with N, with the size of your system, the number of qubits, and also 
with epsilon and the temperature. Okay, so again, this was the formulation of the problem. You want to compute now physical properties at finite energies or finite temperatures. So this extends what I was telling you before. It's not zero temperature, now it can be zero, uh, non zero temperatures or finite energies, not the ground state energy. So very briefly, so classical algorithms. So there exist classical algorithms for solving these problems. And for example, you can use something that is called tensor networks. It's a very uh, practical technique. So for example, for one dimensional system, when your lattice is in one dimension, that's the best method that exists for solving these kind of problems. And then you can show that these classical methods to solve these problems that I mentioned before, uh, for the finite energy, the, the one that I told you before, this case exponentially with one divided by delta. And remember that in the problem, I had to specify the variance. So scale exponentially with one divided by the variance. So the, the, the smaller is the variance, then the longer it takes. And as I mentioned before, to obtain relevant physical information with the delta of the order of one divided by n, and so you plug it here, then you see that this classical algorithm is, 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 is scales exponentially with n. Okay, so this, this means that in general, this problem that I was quoting before, this problem number one of computing properties at finite energies with a classical computer is case exponentially with the best known algorithms. There is another kind of algorithm that are very famous, classical algorithms. It's called quantum Monte Carlo, but it's a classical algorithm. It's for a classical computer in which it's especially suitable for finite temperature. And what it does is that it samples configuration. Okay, so it takes the, I mean, uh, the states of the qubits uh, uh, randomly, and then chooses another one randomly, computes expectation values, and then the probability distribution according to which you're sampling, okay, it's the one that you have to calculate, and there is a method for doing that. However, in many problems, this method of sampling doesn't converge, and this is problems that are called the half sign problem. And in this case, these Monte Carlo algorithms require an exponential time with the size of the system. So say from the point of view of many body physics, there are two kinds of problems for Monte Carlo, quantum Monte Carlo. Some of them have no sign problem and then quantum Monte Carlo works wonderfully well. And the ones for which there is a sign problem for which then this algorithm, it's very bad because they have the sign problem and doesn't work. And many problems are like that, have the sign problem. And that's why quantum Monte Carlo cannot work for all the problems. Okay, what about quantum algorithms for this problem? Well, the first thing that you have to notice is that the problem that I mentioned here, the one of the finite energy or the one of the finite temperature, both of them include the zero temperature, okay? Because if I give you as the energy, this energy here, then this would be the ground state energy. Or if I give you zero temperature, so there will be a peak here. So this would be what happens with the ground state. So this means that in gen full generality, these two problems are QMA hard, so they will be exponential. However, if we increase the, the energy, so if we take larger and larger energies or air or temperatures, then it may happen that then the problem jumps from here to here, and then it's polynomial. And that's what I want to show, that if you increase the energy or if you increase the temperature, then you can avoid the problems that you have with classical algorithm and have even an exponential, the quantum advantage with the systems. And so okay, this will be the last part of my talk in which I will tell you about these algorithms. And okay, so again, that's the problem that I was mentioning before. Somebody gives you some energy density and wants to compute physical properties at this energy density as you increase the number of qubits you go in this direction. And so the algorithm works as follows. So first of all, it takes a state that is easy to prepare and has this expectation value of the energy. So you're giving this energy E and it just prepares some state which has this energy. However, it has a width which is much larger than that. And so this would be a state that your quantum computer could prepare. However, it's not the one that solves the problem because I told you that I want a state that has this mean energy but has some width delta, some variance delta. So for the second step, what we do is the same thing that you, we did before and that you do with light. So you want to make the spectrum narrower, let's put a filter. So we will put a filter, a spectral filter, 
that would make this much narrower and to the desired value of delta. And the third point is that instead of creating the state, instead of saying, okay, let me just create, take the state and do something and create some state and then do a measurement, actually we do something that is more clever than that. So we will use this quantum computer not to create the state, but to compute the things that it requires in order to calculate the physical properties. I will, I will explain you in a second what I mean by that. So we will not create the state because this requires, I mean, uh, some resources that, for example, they are not available with NIST devices or quantum simulators, and we'll do it in a more efficient way than that. Okay, so now let me show you the first step. The first step is take first a state that is physically easy to prepare and that has this energy. For example, a product state. So maybe there exists a product state that has this energy and therefore just prepare the state. So take your mini body system and prepare a product state. And it's very easy to show that this product state that you prepare, then it will, has a, it will have a width here, a variance, which is proportional to a square root of n. It's very big, in fact. So this is why that's not good enough for the problem that we are trying to solve, because we want to have something not only that has this energy, but also that has a very, is very narrow here. And this will be very, very, very broad. Okay, so now, is this always possible to do that? So is it always possible? So if I give you some energy, let's say some, I mean, uh, energy density, can you always find the product state, for example, that has this energy? Well, actually, this is only true if the energy is smaller than some prescribed values. For example, for the ground state, this will not work in general. And it shouldn't work because this is a problem that is QMA hard. And we want to have something efficient. So there would be some energy such that if the energy is larger than this one, then it is always possible to do that. And so now we will concentrate on these energies because for those energies, this algorithm will be efficient. And so this gives you a restriction, but we knew that we will have to have a restriction because we are trying otherwise to solve a problem which is exponentially difficult even for quantum computers. Okay, so the problem here is that I mentioned we have the product state with the right expectation value, but it's too broad. Okay, it's a linear superposition of product of, of, of eigenstates, but actually it has too many. It's not concentrated on some energy. So now let's make it narrow. And the idea is to use the same filter that I introduced for the ground state. Okay, and so we apply this operator here. And so that's the same filter that I had before. And as before, we could write it at the Fourier, I would take the Fourier transform, so to write it as in terms of the evolution operator. And so in principle, what we could do is like we did with the algorithm for the ground state. We could try to apply this filter and to create this linear superposition, but now there is a better, a better way of doing that. And this better way is never create the state. You never, I mean, you are going to apply this filter, but you will never create the state. We're going to use a trick. And what is this trick? Well, I mean, well, let me first mention that. Okay, so now how many terms do we need? So if we have the superposition, if at the end, it's very easy to show that you want to have a value variance delta, then the number of terms will scale like the square root of the number of qubits divided by delta. And the maximum time that will appear here will be one divided by delta. And this is important. Why it's important is because you see that the number of terms in order to apply this filter, it scales polynomially with n and with one divided by delta. So there is no exponential scaling. And this will be important because we have an efficient algorithm and the maximum time in which you will have to apply the dynamics, it also this case like one divided by delta. So everything is polynomial, so that's good, okay? However, as I mentioned, we will not prepare the state because this is a state that will be difficult to prepare. Now it comes the third trick, the third step. And the third step is say, well, at the end, I don't want to prepare the state at the end. I want to compute this expectation value. So this expectation value is, is defined like that. Right? I mean, I divide it now by the norm because the state is not normalized. And so what you can do is replace this formula in this formula and expand it. And so you will have a quotient of something in the numerator and something in the denominator. And it's very easy to show, I mean, I'm not going to do here, that it will depend on these quantities, depend on this quantity, which is just, you start with the state P, evolve 
and then look at p and some other quantities which is very similar and that's the trick the trick is that if you at the end want to get this number you don't have to prepare the state what you have to do is with a quantum computer to compute this a and b and if you can compute this a and b then you replace it in the formula and you have your value okay so the idea is not to prepare state okay because it's very difficult and we, i mean we have a superposition highly entangled but rather than that you use the quantum computer to to compute the parts that you need in your formula and that's another trick that appears in quantum algorithms is namely that i mean you don't prepare states all the time but you just say well, at the end i want to compute some quantity so you just look at the quantity and then see what your quantum computer has to do and then you have to compute these quantities and yes that to, to, to i mean that you see is that this quantity for example this quantity here for an analog quantum simulation has a very simple interpretation you see we start i mean let me compute the absolute value of this quantity which is simple so the absolute value is that you start with some product state you evolve and then you want to compute what is the probability that you're still in your initial state of this quantity squared okay so what you have to do is that you start with some configuration for example if your quantum simulation has qubits or spins then you put the product state which has the property energy then you use your dynamical algorithm to evolve it and then you measure all your qubits and then you see if they are in the original state or not if they are in the original state you say a is equal to one and if they are not you say a is equal to zero then you repeat it repeat it repeat it repeat it repeat it compute the average and this will be this quantity here and then for the phase you have to do something similar you do the same things for the phase and then you compute this quantity so all together what this algorithm does is that solves the problem that i told you before using tricks but in particular it's the quantum computer is just doing is used as a subroutine it's a subroutine which is doing some specific jobs and the classical computer is doing all the computations like here okay so now i can summarize with this quantum algorithm this quantum algorithm prepares a product state of the energy that you asked me then it evolves for certain times right which are of the order of one over delta and then measure evolve measure evolve and measure and then you do it even for different times and, and at the end you collect all the information of the measurements and with that you compute this quantity and now you can do the calculation and see what is the computational time with this method and you see that this grows polynomially with n with one over delta and one over epsilon and you can trace back the fact that this case only polynomially with n to what i mentioned before because the number of terms that we have is polynomial in n and polynomial in one over delta and the maximum time that you have to run your evolution is one over n or is, is n or one over delta and this is why you see there is an exponential speed up with respect to the classical one the classical one i mentioned that was scaling if you take delta equal to one over n that scales exponential here everything is polynomial so that's a quantum kind of supremacy uh, algorithm and the nice thing also is that can be used with analog quantum computer and these devices and in fact so now we are collaborating with people who have these devices and who have analog quantum computers to implement them for problems for which classical computers don't, don't work well okay and i just to finish i think that I'm, I'm out of time now that you can do the same thing for the final temperature and it's very similar the only thing is that now what you can do is that you can use this Monte Carlo algorithm that I told you before. You remember that I told you that there is a classical method that is a Monte Carlo method that it works normally, but whenever there is a sign problem, it doesn't work. So what you can do is to use the quantum computer to overcome the sign problem. So you still sample with a classical computer, but you would use this quantum computer as a subroutine to do the sampling right. I mean, to compute the probabilities that, that you have to sample and this avoids this, this problem and that's how it works. I mean, we did some simulations to show that it would work with analog computers and these devices. And so we expect that if you have something like 100 qubits, then you would be able to have a quantum supremacy. And already with this system to solve problems that are difficult with classical computers or better than with classical computers, but they're still relevant from the physical point of view. So it would be a quantum supremacy experiment if this works well, that not with an academic problem like Google did, but this would be with a relevant physical problem. And that's uh, uh, 
uh, work in progress. Okay, so as a summary, we're talking about quantum algorithms to solve many body problems, quantum many body problems. I talk about the dynamics, zero temperature, finite temperature, and finite energy. So the zero temperature, I give you an algorithm that takes exponential time. Still, it's better than classical algorithm. For finite energy, I give you an algorithm that takes polynomial time, and that's an exponential speed up. And for finite temperature, actually it turns out that this quantum Monte Carlo is a heuristic algorithm, but what this quantum computer avoids overcomes the well-known sign problem in Monte Carlo simulations. And in particular, these two could work with these kind of existing technologies. So the requirements are prepared states and measure. And so there are things that typically can, done, can be done with these devices. And with that, sorry for being a bit late. I'd like to thank you for your attention. Yes, thank you very much for a really interesting talk. Um, so please, everyone, if anyone has any questions, we have a bit of time, hopefully, uh, to answer them and write them uh, in the Q&A section. So first one, I just uh, want to ask a more general question. What kind of systems are currently either used or are promising for analog quantum computers? And what are their advantages, disadvantages compared to digital ones? OK, so, so the most uh, advanced system for analog quantum computer is called atoms in optical lattices. Okay, So the idea there is to have neutral atoms that you make them levitate with light. And then you put the periodic potential created by a standing wave. And so the, this, this way you create a lattice and these atoms can move, for example, in the lattice by tunneling and behave like electrons. And that's the most popular one, but there are also analog simulators with trap ions, with photons and with superconducting computers and uh, superconducting qubits, as well as with quantum dots. But I would say that the most advanced probably are the first two that I mentioned. Now, the advantage is that you, I mean, so typically, if you want to solve problems in physics, then these problems have certain symmetries. For example, they are translational invariant. Okay, so they're, they're homogeneous, the models. So this means that in practice, you don't have to apply an independent uh, gate to each of the qubits, but you can do it globally. And this makes the experience much, much simpler than the, than the once in, with a, a digital quantum computer. The other advantage is that, uh, you see, this, you, you may have errors. And uh, these analog quantum computers, somehow, they, they are very robust to errors. And the reason behind that, I don't have time to explain it in detail, is that at the end, in physical problems, you're interested in intensive quantities. So I mentioned here that you're interested in energy per particle. In the same way, the physical property would be like the magnetization per particle, properties per particle. And it turns out that if you compute properties per particle, then these analog simulators are very robust to errors. So even if there are errors, they will give you some small error in this quantity. And so that's the advantage. The big disadvantage is that they uh, cannot be programmed. They are not universal. So you can solve some specific problems. You may be able to change a couple of parameters, but not to change all possible parameters. So they have limited their utility. OK. okay so there's a few questions coming in. So. I guess it's a more um, question tied with machine learning. So uh, CL asks, are there algorithms leveraging machine deep learning tools? So what means essentially, oh, is this knowledge probably from quantum computation is transferable to other areas besides physics and speed up in those problems? I know if it's um, something that you're OK, so let me tell you a couple, of, a, couple, a couple of connections to this question. So the first thing is that, indeed, you can use now machine learning, classical machine learning, to solve many body problems. And there are people working on that. And that's a very promising area. Okay. However, still, you don't have algorithms that would work. I mean, I mean they are all heuristic, let's say. OK, so nobody promised that they will, will, will work. The second thing is whether now these algorithms that I'm mentioning here and some other quantum algorithms can influence machine learning. And they can influence in two particular ways. So one of them is um, because you can now use quantum systems for machine learning, and then you uh, 
can enhance the expressibility of your neural networks, for example, and that's an area of research. You use a quantum computer just to solve classical problems of machine learning. And um, the other one is that you can get inspired by some quantum algorithms in order to develop even classical machine learning, uh, uh, I mean, to develop classical machine learning tools. And there are people who have been working on that. So now there are many connections between machine learning and quantum computing. And it's not only in one topic, but in many connections. So the classical can help quantum computers, quantum can help classical models and so on. So there are many, many connections. Okay, so there's one question probably aimed at clarifying different points in the, your presentation. So essentially, are there any useful Hamiltonians for which finding the ground state is not QMA hard? Yes, uh, there are Hamiltonians for which it's, uh, it's uh, actually, if you want, in, in P. And this would be like free fermions, free bosons, and... Uh, so that's the, those, those are Hamiltonians or quadratic Hamiltonians, BCS Hamiltonians for fermions, the ones that describe uh, superconductivity, for example. All these Hamiltonians can be solved efficiently with classical computers. So they're even in P. Now, if you ask me about a problem that is in BQ for a ground state that is in BQP, but is not in P, I don't know of any, but that could be interesting to find one. Of course, you can never prove it because we don't know if P is different than BQP. We don't know the relation between the complexity classes, but maybe there is one that can be solved. Uh, okay, so well, I, I could give you one, actually. I can give you one now that that comes to my mind. It's related to tensor networks, which is in different areas, but yeah, so I think that there are, there are some. I don't know if they are useful, if they are connected to some physically relevant property that appears in, let's say, in another field of physics, but there are indeed some, some problems that are in BQP and not, not known to be in P, corresponding to ground states of Hamiltonians. Yeah. So there's one question that essentially was more uh, also similar to my before, essentially analog versus dig digital for molecular systems. Um, OK, yeah. So I think that for molecular systems, at the moment, most of the algorithms, if not all of them but one, are for uh, digital quantum computers. So there are these variational algorithms that people are using for molecular systems or I mean, some other algorithms is uh, adiabatic algorithms and, and so on. And uh, the problem with analog systems is that in chemical systems or in molecules, there are long range interactions. Okay, so there is Coulomb interaction between electrons and the Coulomb interaction, the case is one over R, but still is long range. And the problem is that the quantum simulators that people use in practice, they all have local interactions, so called atoms, the ones that I mentioned before, they have local or very local interactions. So it's, you cannot tune the Hamiltonian in such a way that they describe uh, Coulomb interactions. And so this is why it's more, as I say, there are not so many analog quantum simulators, uh, analog quantum computers for molecule systems. There is one exception though. There was a, and we ourselves wrote a paper a couple of years ago together with Peter Soller and some other people in which we showed that with cold atoms and optical lattices, you could simulate chemistry problems, molecules. And the idea there is that to do to uh, imitate nature? So you probably know I mean, you studied for the ones who studied physics and who studied quantum electrodynamics, is that you can understand the uh, Coulomb interaction between uh, two electrons as the exchange of photons. Okay, so you write this. Uh, I mean, you just couple your uh, electrons to the electromagnetic field, and now you eliminate the magnetic field because there are some, some exchange of photons. Then you get as an effective interaction, the, the Coulomb interaction. So that's the way that you derive from quantum electrodynamics, the Coulomb interaction that is electrostatics. And so now what you could do with an analog simulator is the same thing. So to have two atoms that they don't interact in, with each other, but now they can interact with a third atom that mediates the interaction, that plays the role of the photons. And these atoms play the role of the electrons in the quantum simulator. And this can give rise to a Coulomb potential. And so indeed, there is a proposal for quantum simulation of chemistry systems that is analog. And the idea is to imitate nature and to use, I mean, to get this analog uh, emulation of uh, Coulomb interaction through the interaction with an external, with another particle that would mediate these interactions. Okay. 
So what are the current interest interactions in the tensor network research? Oh, okay, that's a, that's a different topic. <laughs> Yeah. But it's related to simulation of many body systems, but now with classical computers. And there is a method of tensor network. And I would say that the big challenge is now is to go to solve problems in three dimensions, in three spatial dimensions with tensor networks. And also in for condensed matter physics and high energy physics and chemistry. So we know that this tensor networks method work very well in one dimension, start working relatively well in two dimensions, but they don't work in three dimensions and or even for dynamical problems. So that's the current trend to try to develop them for these models where they don't work that well. And then there are many more theoretical problems or more mathematical problems. And one problem that is very interesting that actually we will, we will uh, post a paper um, ne next week is how to create tens quantum algorithms to create tensor networks. And so that's... Uh, I think that connects to my talk. In fact, that's why I mentioned. Yeah. Okay. There's a quite a long question. Uh, just ask, how much time do you have? Um, how would you say, like, I mean, two free questions and then finish? Okay. If that's fine. Okay. okay. So there's three questions in, in total. So uh, Nikita asks, in your computational complexity plot. Early in your excellent talk, you plotted there might exist MP problems in BQP, but is this really possible? And essentially, he said that he thought that MP problems are impossible to solve unless you have a non-deterministic Turing machine available, which no, no. is not possible because physics is deterministic. Okay, no, no. I mean, I give you an example of a problem that is in MP okay. and that is in BQP. It's factoring. You know, you probably have heard of Shor's algorithm. Shor's algorithm is an efficient algorithm in a quantum computer, but is not known to be efficient in a classical computer. So in fact, factory is in NP, is not in P, but is in BQP. That's one example. However, it's not NP complete. So maybe that's the, I mean, the, 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 the question was referring, not if it's in NP, but in NP complete. So, yeah. okay, so my plot shows that there can be problems in NP that are also in B, no, that are in BQP, but they are not in P. However, we don't know, and we believe that there are no problems in NP that are NP complete or NP hard in BQP. Okay. Do you see the possibility to use quantum computing for SME in the near future? I'm not sure what SME means for, uh, and gives an example example for simulation in product development and optimization. Uh, Small and medium enterprises, I guess this is what yeah, you yeah. Right. <laughs> yes. yeah. Okay, so uh, I would say that at the moment, the only ones that I know that I believe that could work is for solving hardware problems, material problems. I, I'm not sure that, this, that there are many S, SMEs, I mean, relate and interested in these problems, uh, but uh, okay, so that's all the ones that I know. There is a lot of hope. However, and there are a lot of let's say in, in interest in using quantum computers, let's say for the first generations for for solving optimization problems. And we know that if we had a scalable quantum computer, not a NIST device, but a scalable one, there are some problems of optimization, especially that could be solved with these quantum computers. And now, I guess that if you talk to as SME, if as SME is working on retail, then maybe they have to bring the tracks from somewhere and go to different, I mean, if it uh, has 20 shops, then, I mean, they have to optimize the, 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 the path of the tracks or the gasoline uh, expenses or whatever. And for that, this could be used. However, this requires a quantum computer that is scalable. We don't have a quantum computer that are scalable. It would take a very long time to have them. And so the question, and that's the, the one that is very interesting and very exciting, and many people working on that, is whether with these NICS devices, with these first generations of quantum computers, we can find some problems that would be in interesting for the industry. I think that SMEs, is, I, mean, I don't believe that there will be anything relevant in the near future, but maybe for the industry, it could be something related to optimization. There are many hopes, but for the moment, as far as I know, there is no I mean, uh, evidence of something like that, or hundred percent evidence of something like that. Okay. 
And the last one is a bit more tears toward tensor networks. And I might rephrase the question is essentially, what are essentially the most used libraries or the ones that you recommend for someone who would want to use these tensor networks and implement their work in research? Um, I think, well, I mean, I'm, I, I, I mean, I was programming some time ago and don't program in the last three years or five years. And uh, I was having my own libraries, but people in my group, they use libraries from different places. So we have our own libraries here. That's why we use these libraries. But I know that there is, a, there are in Google has some very good libraries and also at the Flatiron Institute. And those two are very good. So these are two that I would recommend because they're very, very optimized. Probably there are some that I don't know, but these, these two especially are very, very good. Yeah, and that's it. So again, thank you very much for a really interesting talk. Okay, you're very welcome. on quite a lot of things, and I hope that everyone got at least something out of your talk. So again, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Okay. Bye. Have a nice evening. Thanks.